Today, this podcast is being recorded on Gadigal land. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this country and elders past and present. We extend that respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. You're listening to Sex Talk with Amy. I'm Amy Davidson, and I'm here to candidly confront all the sex-related topics you've been curious about. So let's get stuck into it. Hello, hello, my sexy daredevils, and welcome to episode eight of Sex Talk with Amy. Today, I'm taking you guys to sex school. We're going to chat about all things sex ed, debunk some popular sex myths, and leave you guys with some hot tips. Now, if you're more of a visual learner, there will be a video version of the Sex Ed with Amy tutorial going live on my OnlyFans early next week. So stay tuned for that and let's get stuck into it. When I was new to sex, I didn't really know what I liked. Part of the reason for that is because I'd spent little to no time exploring my own body. Learn how to love fucking yourself. It sounds funny, but enjoying your own rhythm and your own touch. I had to figure out everything on my own. But nowadays, like social media and podcasts and TikTok, those can help you. So putting those guidelines in, it's like you don't have access to learn things in terms of sexual education. And there's people that are too nervous to ask questions. I grew up in a pretty conservative environment. My sex ed was pretty limited. And in my case, it was only heterosex that was talked about. And the words pleasure or self-pleasure were never used. We live in a world that can be so taboo about, oh my God, sex, you can't do it. You can't do it. should never be that way. People need to be able to learn about sex and be comfortable with talking about sex. Whether you want to spice up your sex life, become a better communicator in the bedroom, explore your sexuality more, I hope this podcast will help or inspire you in some way. Whether you're with a new sexual partner or a long-term one, sex is a learning curve. Slap me. I want to see how that feels. Okay, not bad. Okay, choke me. How does that feel? Okay, go a little harder, you know, Scratch me all a bit too hard, but try it again. An orgasm a day keeps the doctor away. And I firmly stand by that. Masturbation was never talked about while I was growing up. Where you like to be touched, how you like to be touched. So what I was doing instead was just going through the motions based on what I'd seen in porn. And my God, what the fuck was going on? There's definitely a few tips that I wish I could give my younger self. So we're going to do that today. Today, 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 today. Look, it goes without saying that sex ed is important, right? And we all know the basic reasons why. Protecting ourselves against unwanted pregnancies and STIs, learning about different contraceptive methods and reproductive systems, understanding consent and boundary setting, learning about physical changes during puberty. The list goes on. But... What's the current state of sex ed in Australia and beyond? Are all of those basics even covered in every school? And what about LGBTQ plus focused sex ed? Is our curriculum as inclusive as it should be? What about conversations surrounding pleasure or self-pleasure? Is sex only being discussed in reproductive terms? We're going to dig deep and suss out what's going on with this in our country right now. But first... I want to share a story with you guys about the early days of my sex ed journey. So my earliest memory of sex education was actually missing it entirely. So I was in year six and I was sick for a day. So I wasn't at school. And then the next day came back, mum gave me a lift. And as soon as we pull up into the school parking lot, a bunch of kids just started running to our car, like running. And these were kids from my class. So I was like, what the fuck is going on? Anyway, I get out of the car and I'm greeted by like six or seven out of breath, prepubescent kids screaming, Amy, you you miss sex education. And I was like, what? And they're like, you miss sex education. And then it dawned on me what the fuck must have happened on the one bloody day that I wasn't at school. Now, I went to a religious private school, of course, because I was so damn lucky. So I don't know if this happens across all schools in year six or what the curriculum is now. But basically, on one particular day of the year, some people from an outside company, not Healthy Harold, but like a sex ed version of Healthy Harold, I don't know. They come to your school with like condoms and bananas and an animated sex ed video and a diagram and, you know, the whole shebang. And basically they give the class like an introductory level sex ed lesson you know how the birds and the bees work using protection going through puberty all that stuff and yeah basically these people came when I was away and if I remember this right our teacher didn't tell us what day of the year they'd be coming on purpose so that we wouldn't spend the whole week prior freaking out and getting too excited about it and asking a whole bunch of questions because that would just annoy the shit out of her and a lot of you are probably listening to this going what the fuck is the big deal like what's going on here why is everyone freaking 
something out. Why is a teacher being all hush hush about it? Why is there kids screaming in parking lots and running at cars over this event, if you can call it that? You have to understand, we weren't like other kids that went to other schools. We weren't like other 10 to 12 year olds from your average Anglo family who probably already knew the basics of how the birds and the bees worked anyway. We were Christian, Armenian, some of us Middle Eastern, conservative kids from very traditional and very strict families. Having an outside person come in and say words like penis and vagina in front of us without any hesitation was mind boggling at our age in that community. And for some of the parents, not all of them, but some of them, even that was too much in their opinion. It was like the equivalent of us being allowed to watch porn or something. And this was before TikTok, before Instagram, any of that. So if we missed out on hearing that shit, it's not like we're getting it anywhere else. So yeah, missing that day was kind of a big deal. And my friends reminded me of that the whole fucking day, the whole fucking day. And mind you, I was still recovering from food poisoning at this point, but kids are absolute savages. Anyway, all day they'd be asking questions like, oh, what's a contraceptive diaphragm? What does it mean when a sperm fertilizes an egg? What's an erection? And of course, I didn't know the answers to any of that shit because I was too busy going to church and using coloring books. So I'd just be like, I don't know, I don't know to everything. And the kids would laugh and be like, we know, we know. So to those kids who ruined my fucking day, if you're listening to this, you'd be like 25, 26 now. Fuck you. (laughs) Fuck you. And also look at me now with a sex show and everything. So guess what? Now I know. I'm not traumatized at all by this event, by the way. Can you tell? (laughs) Anyway, I'm pretty sure I'm all caught up now on what they learned that day, but I'm curious to know what the curriculum's like now. So we're going to look into it. But just a quick important disclaimer before we jump in, the third party sources used to communicate info on sexual health, education systems, and any medical references during this episode will be listed in the show notes below. So please visit those links for more info. Sexual health forms part of the Aussie curriculum across all levels of primary and secondary school, delivered in age-appropriate ways for different year groups. In high school, the bulk of sex ed happens between year 7 and 10, covering conception, pregnancy, sexual behaviours, contraception, STIs, relationships, intimacy and consent. While we do have a national curriculum for sex ed, not all states cover it equally, and some schools do the bare minimum. According to the latest national survey of secondary students in sexual health, many young people say their sex ed experience lacked relevance and inclusivity, with major disparities from school to school. Common issues raised include lacking references to non-heterosex, minimal references to sex as an act of pleasure, not enough focus on gender diversity, and lessons containing outdated beliefs and attitudes that don't represent the sex-positive mindset of youth today. Back in 2021, ABC News reported results from a survey conducted the year prior by Melbourne teenager Tamsin Griffiths, who surveyed 500 students across different schools, many of them declaring that their sex ed lessons were outdated. Tamsin told ABC News, we need more information than just how to put condoms on bananas. It's not all about babies and marriage anymore. The curriculum excludes topics like pleasure. One night stands and casual sex are very common these days, but the curriculum reduced sex to its practical reproductive function. She also went on to say that survey results indicated the curriculum didn't represent LGBTQI plus community appropriately. She told ABC, when I look around my friendship group and within society, so many young people's experiences are just not represented in the curriculum. Sex is a natural part of life, so why is it not taught adequately in schools? If people in the LGBTQI plus community have to learn about heterosexual relationships, why don't we have to learn about non-heterosexual relationships? So, what's being done about this? Well, back when this was published in 2021, the ABC approached the ACARA, which delivers the national curriculum, asking how it addressed non-heterosex and pleasure, among other things. A spokesperson responded by saying the curriculum does include specific modules on relationships and sexuality for Year 10 students, focusing on the physical, social and emotional changes that occur over time and the significant role relationships and sexuality play in these changes. However, it was expected that students would learn about these things at appropriate intervals throughout their education, in a way that was broken down into age-appropriate concepts from years 3 to year 10. 
according to a report published by SBS last year. The national syllabus for sexual health is based on child developmental theory, which takes into account the physical, emotional and psychological stages of human maturing. And secondary schooling advisor Renee West says, the resources are reflective of UNESCO's international guidance on sexuality education, which has been evaluated for decades to make sure that we're in line with what should be taught and to make sure it's inclusive of all students. While inclusivity being factored into the national curriculum is a positive step, students' experiences with inclusive and holistic sex ed vary across Australia. According to a 2018 article by SBS News, studies revealed that a large number of students were discontent with the quality of their sex ed, with one in 10 declaring they received none at all. La Trobe University's Dr Fisher, who leads the five-yearly National Survey of Secondary Students and Sexual Health, says, Some young people told us how amazing they found sex ed, that they learned so much. But then, down the street, someone else maybe isn't getting as good of an education as the school up the road. So why is the quality of sex ed so imbalanced? According to reports, the rollout of quality sex ed can vary considerably depending on a student's state, territory, school, or even their teacher. Not only that, but the degree to which schools decide to implement the national curriculum and how they choose to convey certain bits of information can be strongly influenced by religious and cultural beliefs that exist within that school's community. Renee West from the New South Wales Department of Education says, teachers adapt the syllabus to their school's cultural and religious context while balancing the community's values of diversity and inclusion. According to the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, schools can decide the time and emphasis given to certain topics in the curriculum. Over the years, a number of professionals have highlighted the pros and cons to this approach, explaining that while it gives schools the flexibility to teach sex ed in a way that's reflective of their school's beliefs and community values, it creates the risk of sex ed not being taught in a comprehensive way, or possibly being skipped entirely. Dr. Sanjak Dar, senior lecturer at Monash University, says that religious schools should acknowledge that students are sexual beings who would benefit from comprehensive discussions of sex and relationships. Dr. Ollis, associate professor at Deakin University, believes schools should adopt a more sex-positive approach to sex ed, with an emphasis on body positivity, discussing gender and sexual diversity, giving and receiving pleasure, starting a relationship, and love. She also emphasizes the need to look beyond abstinence-only teachings, taking into account that almost 70% of students have already experienced some type of sexual activity before formal sex ed classes even start. So with quality sex ed being pretty hit and miss depending on where you are and what school you go to, is there a state or territory in Australia that seems to be upstaging the rest of us with their sex ed game? Apparently there is. It's Victoria. Victoria's been dubbed the most progressive state in Australia when it comes to sex ed. Sexuality and consent education is compulsory across both government and Catholic schools in Victoria up to year 10, with consent education staying compulsory up to year 12 for government schools. Sex Education Australia, or SEA, is responsible for delivering school programs in the areas of sexuality and relationships across the state. SEA is not affiliated with any religious or political organisations, and they deal in facts, not opinions. Victoria State Government's Department of Education acknowledges that sex education is not just about biology, which is why they prefer the term sexuality education. They define good, school-based sexuality education as comprehensive, inclusive, ongoing and supported by the latest research. Their programs are designed to allow students to ask questions and discuss issues relevant to them. Take Geelong's Northern Bay College, for example, which reportedly has a trailblazing comprehensive sexuality education embedded across its curriculum. In partnership with Family Planning Victoria, Deakin University and the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development, Northern Bay College has been delivering the Sexuality Education and Community Support Project for a number of years now. The goal of the project is to transform the way sexuality education is taught in the college and to help other schools in the area achieve the same. In recent years, Victoria's reproductive and sexual health education has evolved a lot, with new teaching resources and initiatives like the Safe Schools program, which launched in 2010, with over 500 schools reportedly signing up and pledging to create safer and more inviting environments for LGBTQI students. But despite the state's progressive approach to sex ed, it hasn't been exempt from backlash, with parents, political conservatives and the wider community criticising it. According to a Sydney Morning Herald article from 2019, Family Planning Victoria, an organisation that sends specialist sex educators into schools, has found principals growingly questioning their reproductive diagrams, especially ones of the vulva and clitoris, as well as any references to masturbation or sex being pleasurable. One principal even went as far as cancelling the session altogether over concerns about parental backlash. 
So based on that overview of the current sex ed landscape in our country, I think it's pretty safe to say that some change is needed. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, we all know sex ed is important, but what's more important is the quality of sex ed we're getting. A 2005 study published in the Sex Education Journal revealed that countries with comprehensive sexuality education, including the Netherlands, have lower rates of unwanted pregnancies, as well as fewer HIV and STI transmissions. A number of other studies provide evidence that talking about sexual health matters regularly and early in supportive environments helps youth make better choices, tends to delay sex initiation, and ensures young people obtain accurate information. Now, those are pretty good incentives for high-quality, comprehensive sex ed, don't you think? But what does that look like? Here's what Planned Parenthood has to say. Planned Parenthood is a non-profit organization in the US that provides sexual health care, education, and information to millions of people worldwide. According to the organization, comprehensive sex ed refers to K-12 programs that cover a broad range of topics relating to human development, including puberty, anatomy, sexual orientation, and gender identity relationships, including self, family, friendships, romantic relationships, and healthcare providers. Personal skills, including communication, boundary setting, negotiation, and decision making. Sexual behavior, including the full spectrum of ways people choose to be or not to be sexual beings. Sexual health, including sexually transmitted infections, birth control, pregnancy, and abortion. Society and culture, including media literacy, shame and stigma, and how power, identity, and oppression impact sexual wellness and reproductive freedom. Education staff at Planned Parenthood reach 1.2 million young people across America per year, most of them being middle school or high school students. They offer a range of programming options, including evidence-based sex ed programs that are proven effective, LGBTQ-focused programs, and peer education programs. So what's the equivalent of Planned Parenthood in Australia? Well, the premier nationwide sexual health and family planning organization in our country is the Family Planning Alliance Australia, or the FPAA, which is focused on enhancing the management and delivery of sexual and reproductive health care and education in the areas of contraception, STIs, pregnancy and termination, domestic and sexual violence, comprehensive sexuality education, and more. For more information on the FPAA, visit the link in the show notes below. Speaking of revamping the sex ed curriculum, you know which movie kind of had the right idea? The Girl Next Door, starring Alicia Cuthbert and Emile Hirsch. A fucking classic. Honestly, I kind of got onto this movie late. It came out in like 2004, but I still think it's underrated. If you haven't watched it yet, you need to get onto it. And I don't want to spoil it, but I kind of have to, to be honest, to talk about this. But basically, at the end of the movie, a group of high school guys who are about to graduate link up with a couple of porn stars and they create a modernized version of a sex ed video for high school students that ends up being sold nationwide. And in the clip, one of the porn stars is like, no condoms or bananas in this video. We're gonna teach you how to put a condom on the real thing. And then she rips off her like teacher outfit and she's just in lingerie and yeah, puts a condom on the dude's dick. And all the people in the class watching it are like, whoa. Anyway, I'm not saying we have to go to that extreme to revamp our sex ed curriculum, but I remember what the one sex ed video I saw in high school was like. And honestly, if it was anything more like what the girl next door did, I would have definitely paid more attention. Tell me the truth. Okay, now it's time to bust some myths about sex and sexual health. There's a lot of them swirling around out there, but I've narrowed it down to 11 of the most common ones. 11. If someone has an STI, you can always tell. Actually, you can't. This is false. While it's true that some people do experience and show symptoms of an STI when they contract one, it's not always the case. For example, according to a publication by the Ohio State University and Wexner Medical Center, chlamydia is one of the most common STIs in women under 25. It's known as a silent infection since most people never experience symptoms. Chlamydia can also be confused with symptoms associated with yeast infections. So the only surefire way to know whether you have an STI or not is by getting tested. 10. You can't use condoms if you're allergic to latex. This is false. According to studies, around 1.6% of the general population is thought to have latex allergies, but fortunately, there are many brands that make latex-free condoms, and these are widely available for purchase. Nine. If a biological female is sexually aroused, she won't need to use any lube. This is false. A woman's level of arousal isn't always synonymous with vaginal wetness. It's possible to be highly aroused and still experience vaginal dryness or insufficient natural lubrication. This can affect women of all ages for different reasons. There are many factors that impact whether or not a woman needs additional lubrication, including certain medications, pregnancy, menopause, where they're at in their monthly cycle, and so on. Eight. The pull-out method is safe and prevents pregnancy. False. Different studies report a 20-30% to failure rate when it comes to pulling out before ejaculation. 
During sex, men discharge bodily fluids known as pre-cum before ejaculation happens. Studies have shown that pre-cum can contain live swimming sperm. And since it only takes one sperm to fertilize an egg, relying on the pull-out method alone is risky. In fact, it's been reported that four out of 100 women who exclusively rely on this method will become pregnant during one year. While the effectiveness of the pull-out method can be enhanced when it's done in combination with the use of birth control pills, this method provides no protection against STIs. Seven. Wearing two condoms gives you extra protection. False. Using two condoms provides less protection than using just one due to the friction between them as they rub together. This causes the material to weaken and increases the risk of the condoms tearing. Six. You can't get an STI from oral sex. False. Sexually transmitted infections can be passed on this way due to the exchanging of bodily fluids. It's possible to contract an STI in the mouth or throat after giving oral sex to someone with a genital, anal, or rectal STI. These include gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes, syphilis, and HPV. To increase your protection against these infections, you can use dental dams when performing oral sex. A dental dam is a thin, flexible piece of latex that protects against direct mouth-to-genital or mouth-to-anus contact during oral sex. Five. Vaginal orgasms are common. This is not true. Studies show that around 75% of people with vaginas can't orgasm from penetration alone and need clitoral stimulation in addition to or independent of vaginal penetration in order to reach climax. Four. You can't get pregnant if you have sex on your period. Not true. Although less likely, you can still get pregnant if you have unprotected sex while menstruating. This is because sperm can stay alive in the female reproductive system for up to five days. So if you have sex towards the end of your period and ovulate early in your cycle, it is possible to fall pregnant from the surviving sperm. Three. You can get an STI from a toilet seat. False. According to medical professionals, since bacterial STIs can't survive outside the environment of mucous membranes in the body, it's nearly impossible to contract one by sitting on public toilet seats. And as far as viral causes of STIs are concerned, they can't survive for long outside the human body either, so they generally die quite quickly on surfaces like toilet seats. So HIV can be transmitted through any bodily fluid. This is false. HIV is transmissible through four bodily fluids, semen, blood, breast milk, and vaginal secretions. However, it's not transmitted through any other bodily fluids like urine, saliva, or tears. One. Real life sex is like what you see in porn. This is false and is most commonly believed by young people who consume porn during their schooling years. As many adults already know, both professionally produced and amateur pornography is often performative, unrealistic, and can also be violent. Pornographic depictions of people being choked, gagged, spanked, and so on can leave sexually inexperienced youth with the false impression that all individuals are interested in being treated this way during sexual encounters. While kinks and fetishes that involve physical impact do exist in the real world, these porn scenes, more often than not, don't discuss or demonstrate the act of sexual partners asking each other for consent because those discussions have already been had behind the scenes between the porn actors, producers, and so on. Boundaries are set, and discussions around comfortability with certain sex acts are already had prior to scenes being recorded so that during the shoot, performers can focus primarily on staying in character and behaving in a way that may not necessarily be natural, but is more so intended to be entertaining to the viewer. This can include exaggerated moans, facial expressions, verbal dialogue, and physical movements, which can cause a young mind to confuse fantasy with reality and develop unrealistic expectations for their forthcoming sexual experiences. All right, now that we've busted some myths, let's get on to some actual sex tips. And I want to start with the basics. So we're going to talk about how to put a condom on a penis. Condoms are designed to protect against both pregnancy and STIs. When used correctly, they're estimated to be 98% effective. But when they're used improperly, such as putting them on the wrong way or removing them haphazardly, this can drop down to 85% effectiveness or less. So how do you make sure you're using them correctly so you and your partner are getting the most protection possible? I'm going to take you through it step by step. The first thing to do is to make sure the condom isn't out of date. So check the use by date printed on the packet before you open it. Gently open the packet to take the condom out, but don't use your teeth to open the packet as this might cause a tear in the condom. Place the condom over the tip of an erect penis. If the penis is uncircumcised, gently pull back the foreskin first. What you might notice at the tip of the condom is something sticking out that kind of looks like a nipple. This is called a reservoir tip. Use your thumb and forefinger to gently pinch it to squeeze the air out. 
Before you proceed with the next step, make sure you've placed the condom on the right way with the ring around the base facing outwards as this will help you roll the condom down to the base of the shaft with ease. If you notice that you've placed the condom on inside out or feel some resistance as you start to roll it down, throw the condom out and start fresh with a new one. So once you've pinched the tip, gently roll the condom all the way down to the base of the penis and now you're good to go. If you'd like to use lubricant during penetrative sex, water-based or silicone lube are safe to use over condoms. However, you should avoid using anything that has oil in it, like Vaseline, baby oil, lotion, or any oil-based lubes with latex condoms, as this can damage the condom and cause it to break. Once you're done having sex, start to withdraw your penis while it's still erect, but make sure you're holding the condom at the base while you do that to avoid the condom sliding off or any spillage from the condom making contact with your partner's vagina. Once you've taken the condom off, you can tie a knot at the base of the condom to avoid the contents spilling everywhere and throw it out in the bin. Oh, and one more tip, don't flush condoms down the toilet because this can cause plumbing issues. If you want to check out a video tutorial of everything I just described, NHS has a great YouTube video demonstrating how to put a condom on, so I'll leave a link to that in the show notes below. Now, for some of you listening, especially the guys, putting on a condom might be second nature to you at this point. So you're not even really thinking about it while you're going through the steps, but I really think people with vaginas should be equally knowledgeable on how to put a condom on properly, even if you're not the one putting it on someone. So you can actually watch what they're doing and make sure they're putting it on properly. Because I remember in my early years of having sex, putting on a condom was something the guy always just took care of on his own. And oftentimes I wouldn't really even be paying attention during that moment while he was putting it on. I just kind of trusted that he knew what he was doing and I'd be too busy, you know, getting into position or trying to look sexy. And I just kind of figured that, you know, putting on a condom must be a really easy thing and how could he possibly stuff it up? But in reality, putting your safety completely in someone else's hands is never a great idea. You have to stay vigilant, especially with a new sexual partner because you really don't know what someone doesn't know. And at the end of the day, sex involves traditionally two people or even more than two people. So ensuring safety is a collective responsibility and it shouldn't just fall on one partner. So the more you know, the more you can protect yourself and other people as well. Okay, now for my next hot tip, educate yourself on the erogenous zones. When it comes to sexual arousal, we all have certain hot spots in our body that are extra sensitive to the touch. Stimulating them either by ourselves or with a partner can be incredibly effective in heightening sexual arousal, and it's a great element to add to foreplay as well. While there's common erogenous zones across all bodies, people experience sensitivity or pleasure in these areas to varying degrees, favoring some more than others. For any fellow fans of the TV show Friends, you might remember the iconic scene where Monica is teaching Chandler about female erogenous zones. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can find a link to this clip in the show notes below. Now, common erogenous zones for women include the clitoris, vagina, breasts, and lower back. Common ones for men are the pubic hairline, penis, scrotum, and perineum. And common ones for both genders include the ears, lips, the back and nape of the neck, the nipples, and inner thighs. So get exploring and find your favorite erogenous zones today. Now, you might have heard me say this during the intro song at the top of today's episode, but an orgasm a day keeps the doctor away. And it's not just the orgasm part that's important, it's masturbation. Learning how to fuck yourself in a way that feels good to you using your fingers and or sex toys and setting time aside to pleasure yourself as regularly as possible can not only benefit your sex life as you learn more about your body and how to guide your partner around it, it also has legit health benefits like stress reduction, tension relief, improvements in mood and sleep, increased focus, and an enhanced sex life. Okay, this next one's a bit bizarre, but hear me out, because there is some research on this. Apparently, wearing socks during sex can increase your chances of having an orgasm. Now, I've never made the conscious decision to leave my socks on during sex or while I'm masturbating, but it's definitely happened in the heat of the moment. But basically, this Dutch study once concluded that 80% of women wearing socks were able to achieve orgasm. According to the study author, Gert Holstige, chairman of the Center of Euroneurology at the University of Grenada, in the Netherlands. At the beginning of their trials, only 50% of their female subjects were able to reach orgasm. But then they learned that the women were uncomfortable because they had cold feet. So they gave them socks and 80% of them reached orgasm. Apparently, the temperature in a room as well as your own body temperature can make a huge difference and so does comfortability. During the study, Gert Holstage noticed that female participants demonstrated less activity in parts of the brain that process fear and anxiety after they were given socks and concluded that socks helped them reach the level of relaxation they needed to climax. 
Look, I know the socks on during sex thing can be pretty polarizing and some people even say it gives them the ick, but I personally don't care that much and it is getting colder down under at the moment, so why not give it a shot? Speaking of comfortability, this next one might sound a bit basic, but pillows are your sex life's best friend. If you're a sexually active gal or just a good old fashioned comfort queen, you can never have too many pillows or cushions lying around. And I know because I grew up going to church, so I spent a lot of time on my knees (laughs) without a cushion, mind you. So yeah, pillows can be great for everyone involved, but especially for the girlies or really anyone performing fellatio and you're kneeling, put a pillow down on the ground for your knees. Fellatio is hard work and you deserve to feel as comfortable as possible. There are sex pillows and wedges out there on the market made specially for certain positions and stuff, but even just using the right kind of regular pillows can do the trick as well. Um, Have some special pillows that are your designated sex pillows that you keep separate. And same for people with vaginas as well. If someone's performing cunnilingus on you, have a pillow under your bum to elevate your hips. It creates a better angle for clitoral stimulation, it improves your overall coital alignment, and it's just more comfortable for you. Brace yourselves for this next and final one because it's even more bizarre than the one about socks. We're going to talk about the grapefruit method, which is a sex technique founded by YouTuber Auntie Angel, and apparently it produces the most intense orgasms for men. First of all, Auntie opens the video by saying, I believe every man should get grapefruited. And quite honestly, my explanation of this technique will never do it justice. So please watch Auntie Angel's video. I will leave a link to it in the show notes below. But basically, all you need to get started is a grapefruit. And Auntie Angel recommends getting a ruby red grapefruit specifically because they're sweeter and easier to work with apparently. Alternatively, if you or your partner have a grapefruit allergy, you can use a large navel orange instead. So start by making sure the grapefruit is at room temperature. Then you're going to roll it across a table or a hard surface to juice it up a bit. The juicier, the better. Then you're going to find the navel. There's two navels to the grapefruit. Once you do that, you're going to place it on a plate and the navel's on the outside. You take a knife, you cut one side of that navel off. Then you do the same on the other side. And just a disclaimer, as part of this technique, your man is not supposed to see any of this prep, but we'll get to that part later. Now, what you'll have left is the middle portion of a grapefruit that has two sides missing. Next, you're going to cut a hole in the middle of the grapefruit, approximately the same size as your partner's penis. Try not to make it too big or too tight. Just get as close to the right size as you possibly can. So take the knife midway down the grapefruit and make sure it goes all the way through and then make a nice circular hole in the middle of the grapefruit. Now, if you fuck up the sizing of this hole a little bit and make it too big, for example, Angel says you can just squeeze the grapefruit like muscles in your vagina. And if you make it too tight, take your finger and push the flesh inside the grapefruit back. And now comes the part where you involve your man in what's going on. Now, Auntie Angel says a non-negotiable part of this technique is that he has to be blindfolded because think of it this way. What the heck would your boyfriend say if you randomly came into the bedroom with a grapefruit? He'd probably be like, what the fuck are you going to do with that thing? So Auntie Angel says an element of surprise is important for this to really work and for him to be at ease. Here's what Miss Angel recommends you say to him. Hey, baby. Tonight, I want to do something a little freakier. I want to suck your dick blindfolded. Now, once you have him blindfolded and laying down on the bed, you have to make sure you get him erect before you start with the grapefruit technique. So suck that dick. Once he's nice and wet from your oral lovemaking, you're going to replace your mouth with the grapefruit. You're going to twist that grapefruit up and down his shaft and suck the head at the same time. Now, while you're performing this technique, he's going to be having an amazing time, but he's still not going to know what's going on. So now's the time for the grand reveal. You're going to tell him to take that blindfold off. Once he sees that grapefruit on his penis, he's probably going to be like, what the fuck are you doing? But according to Auntie Angel, since it's going to feel so damn good, he's going to wish he'd been fucking a grapefruit all these years. I'm not going to lie, guys. It sounds hella strange, but I trust Auntie Angel. And honestly, I'm pretty keen to try this soon with a willing participant. Some people swear by this and men who've experienced this in the past have said that it feels great because it feels more natural than a hand does. So yeah. Question, question, my love, question. And now, 
The time has come for me to answer your burning questions. Now, for any newcomers to the show, Ask Amy is a weekly segment we do for every episode where I answer your questions sent through via socials or through email at sextalkwithamy at gmail.com and you get to remain anonymous. So if you want to take part, just send through your questions or ideas for the pod and remember... Nothing is off limits. Number one. A lot of guys say that sex feels better without a condom, but do women feel any difference? Me personally, for the majority of my sexually active life, I've had protective sex, but I have had unprotected sex with one long-term partner. And I do have to say that you can feel some difference in sensation. I would say it does feel a little better raw, but overall it doesn't have a major impact on my pleasure. Number two. Is it rude to ask a new partner what their body count is? Now, obviously at some point in any adult romantic or sexual relationship, it's pretty likely that conversations about sexual history will come up and they can can be important to have for different reasons as long as it's approached in a healthy way. So this conversation can include sharing how many sexual partners you've had, whether or not you've ever contracted STIs, whether or not you've ever been tested for an STI or how long ago your last sexual health check was and so on. And this can help you better understand each other's sexual health, level of sexual experience and sexual preferences as well. And this will help you make better informed decisions about your sex life together. Understandably, bringing this up in a new relationship can be tricky or feel daunting for some people. But as far as the right time to do this goes, I don't think there's a concrete answer. I think feelings of readiness for that conversation will vary between different couples. But many people like to have this conversation when they're thinking about having sex with their new partner for the first time or around the time that they've just recently become sexually active with this new person. But going back to the question about whether it's rude or not to ask your new partner about their body count, I think it depends on the context in which you're asking them your intentions and your motives behind it. If it's just a matter of plain curiosity and wanting to learn more about them, or it is genuine concerns about your sexual health and wanting to make sure that you're both safe and you've been tested and things like that, either way, those reasons are understandable and common reasons to want to have that conversation which is fine as long as you approach it at an appropriate time with a non-judgmental tone. On the flip side though, if it's coming from a place of moral judgment or insecurity, then that's not good because say for example, they end up telling you a number that's too high for your liking based on your own personal opinions about promiscuity and things like that, then that could negatively impact the way you feel about them and the way you treat them even, which is not right. If it's coming from a place of insecurity, same thing. If you hear them say a number that's higher than what you'd prefer to be, then that could also trigger you in a negative way because say in this hypothetical scenario, the person asking has their own sexual insecurities relating to performance or being less experienced in the bedroom than their partner. Hearing that higher number can make them feel intimidated or nervous if they find out their new partner is more experienced or they've had a more diverse range of sexual experiences in their past. So if that's the case, it's important to remain self-aware about your own sexual insecurities or prejudices in order to avoid avoid reacting from a place of judgment or blame when your new partner tells you what their body count is and vice versa. Three. If you had an orgy, how many men or women would you want in it? I think six or eight would be good numbers because I think having an even number of men and women would be fun so that everyone can be, you know, getting busy at all times and there's a sausage for every bun. Four. Would you ever let a guy watch you have sex? Um, yeah, I think that would be kind of hot, actually. I do actually have, I guess you could say, a cuckolding fantasy where I'm fucking a guy who, in this case, would be the bull in cuckolding terms and another dude is watching. Five. Lights on or lights off during sex? I think lights off, but with enough light in the room to still see each other clearly enough to not be like headbutting each other. I think that's hot as fuck. I think when one of your senses is lowered, it heightens the other and you can focus more on really feeling each other's bodies. That's why I think night sex is really hot too, because it's dark and the rest of the world is more quiet as well. So you can really just focus more on the sensations your body is feeling. I love colored lights as well, especially blue, red or violet. So having the main light in a bedroom switched off, but having like a small LED light in the corner of the room that lights up the room in red or blue or something but it's not super bright that and some lo-fi r&b music that would really set the scene for me six what made you decide to do porn 
honestly, it's something I've been wanting to do for a really long time. I've been an avid consumer of porn for quite some time and I wanted to make my own. I actually started doing it a couple of years ago, but kind of stopped because at that time in my life, I was still working for other companies and finishing up a degree as well. So I was hesitant about going fully public with it because I was still affiliated with other people's brands. But now that that conflict of interest is completely out of the way, I can literally just do whatever I want because the only person I'm representing is myself. Seven. Do you like calling guys daddy? <laughs> yeah, I do. Not every guy though. Some guys, I think, naturally have a daddy vibe and I don't think it always has something to do with their physical build, even though that helps. It's more of an energy that certain guys carry that turns me on and makes me want to call them daddy. But yeah, it's it's definitely something I say embarrassingly frequently. And um, luckily I'm seeing someone now who's really into it. So yeah. <sighs> that wraps up this week's episode, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and for sending in those questions. Now today I'm actually feeling extra grateful because just yesterday, Sex Talk with Amy celebrated its three month anniversary. <laughs> Now, I know three months isn't really a huge milestone for a podcast, but for some reason, it feels like it's been way longer. I don't know, probably because I've been running my damn mouth so much. But anyway, thank you so much to everyone who's been listening and supporting the show so far. None of this would be possible without you, and I'm so keen for what's ahead. Next episode will be airing Wednesday, 19th April, and we'll be having a very special guest on the show who I'm really excited to talk to. So get keen for that and come and celebrate Hump Day with me. Until then, if you're loving the podcast and want to stay up to date, give us a follow on Spotify and hit the download button on this episode to revisit your favorite moments. Hope you guys have a beautiful week ahead. Keep it fun, keep it fresh, keep it safe, keep it sexy, and I'll see you guys next time. This is Amy Davidson signing off. <laughs>